Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for this event in a very especially busy time for all of our lives. Uh, as a school leader, I don't know about you, maybe as parents can relate, uh, once we hit May, it's just a blur until school is out, and then I come to and not sure what happened to me. Um, so I just thank you for giving up time tonight to talk about this important topic uh, and being with us. I also want to thank the APT and especially uh, Lisa Olson as a liaison for food service. Um, her work and leadership has helped make this possible tonight and this partnership is continuing to bloom and I'm grateful that she has been by my side and by all our sides as we've had this discussion. I will also want to thank Quest Food Services Management for their dedication to the food service uh, in the district and their partnership. When we started having these conversations, uh, Quest was intimately involved in the conversation and was ready and willing to engage in how we can continue to improve um, as a district and as a partner. And that speaks volumes to uh, their caliber of professionalism in the field and we're excited that they are with us. The purpose of the Let's Talk series, and we've done a couple of them this year so far. Um, it's an idea that Melissa came up with where uh, we were bringing the community together to engage in timely topics. Uh, too often, I think we find ourselves at board meetings and there are conversations at the board or at the administration, and I don't think that we do or did uh, a great job of inviting our community in uh, stakeholders, representative voices to really engage in thoughtful dialogue outside of the board meeting venue. Uh, of course, we encourage board participation or public participation at board meetings, but uh, to have a real uh, meaningful dialogue about any topic of interest, we think th these uh, avenues or mediums are far more productive to find meaningful results of whatever topic or concern uh, we are addressing. So I just wanted to uh, make sure that you understand the purpose of why we have these. Uh, when we have done them in the past, we have limited these to a one hour experience. Uh, there has been some lightning topic, or, or, um, uh, emotional topics in the past, and I think staying true to an hour really gives us some guardrails to have a good conversation, but also put an ending spot to those conversations as well. Um, I don't think tonight is going to be polarizing, or I'm hoping you're not going to be. Um, emotional about this, uh, however passionate about it, because it is something that is especially important when we talk about health and overall well-being of our students and the future of uh, their life choices. So I would like to um, first go over who's on the panel. And I'm going to do the introductions, uh, not because they're not amazing folks, but just to keep things going. And then I will turn it over to Rebecca Cohen from Quest, who will walk us through the survey results from the food service that, uh, survey that we did in 67. So we are fortunate enough to have uh, the following folks with us tonight, giving up time to help us uh, talk through these uh, topics. First one is Dr. Jennifer Hermes, who is the Chief Operating Officer for both 67 and 115. Uh, Lisa Olson, who is, like I said previously, the APT Food Service Liaison. Tanner Van Dusen, who is APT Food Service Committee Member of the 67 APT. Nick Saccaro, who is the President of Quest Food Service Management, and we're so grateful that he's here giving up time um, as the President of the company. Rebecca Cohen, who is the District Manager for uh, Quest Food Management, as well as Margaret Black, who is a Food Service Director. And then we have Rob Wegleaf as our DPM Dean of Culture. So I am most grateful for them to be with us to partake in this conversation tonight. Now that introductions are finished, I would like to turn it over to Rebecca so she can go over the survey results from our uh, 2022 food service survey. Hello everyone. Thanks for having us. So I, I believe you're all aware that we put out a survey and the purpose of the survey was to get the community's feedback because we haven't been open in two years, right? And a lot of the program is new to a lot of you or we haven't had it in a while. And so we wanted to get clarity and direction of where everybody wanted to see the program to go. And our mission, vision and values is something that we strive for every day at Quest. And our mission is to provide communities like Lake Forest fresh, high quality food and intensely personal service, which is why we're here today. To, and I'm gonna share the results with you. So we had 240 responses, which was 
we think a great response rate and participation so thank you to all who participated and the main reason why purchases why people purchase their students purchase food or beverages is convenience that's no surprise there is 91 percent overwhelming amount the main reason why they students did not purchase food or beverage was quality was 62 percent variety was 34 percent and price or the value was 26 percent the quality of food was rated excellent or good was 27 and a half percent oops fair was 47 percent and then poor was 24 percent variety was a little bit higher with excellent or good at 30 percent fair at 45 percent and poor at 24 percent so we asked, what was one thing that you wanted to make sure that did not change about food service? And fruit and veggie bar by far was the most common response, which we started, I believe, January, February, something like that, maybe after spring break. So we're happy to have the fruit and veggie bar back now that COVID is getting a little better. Variety of options. We have a lot of options, especially at Deer Path. Ease of ordering, a lot of other schools, especially for elementary, have pre-ordering, which we do not do that. You can decide what you want right when you're there. And having, having offerings that kids will eat. So not everything needs to be healthy. Was These are all comments made by parents. Portion sizes, they felt like the portion sizes were ample enough. Vegetarian options, we tried to have at least one or two vegetarian options every day that rotate. Staff is wonderful, like Vilma back here and speed of lines. <laughs> they felt like students got through the lines pretty quickly enough time to eat. Overall satisfaction, wait, make sure one thing, um, I think there's a slide missing, but that's okay. Overall satisfaction on a scale of one to five, five or four, so five being the highest, was 24%, three was 36%, and one or two at 40%. So some key themes, I kind of summarize all the comments to do some major key themes, and the biggest by far was the healthier options. So now we wanted to get the survey out to get actual real data, not just anecdotal, because you know we get parent, Margaret, our food service director, gets probably, especially in the beginning of the year, maybe 50 emails a day saying, where's the Gatorade, where's the cookies, we want healthier food. So we're getting a lot of contradictory feedback from parents that's why we did the survey. We wanted real data to see what parents and students wanted to see in the program. So less sugar or limit to special treat days. Kid-friendly, meaning food that kids will eat. Healthier vegetarian vegan options. The common most popular vegetarian options are cheese-based, right? The cheese quesadillas, the grilled cheese. So coming up with more creative vegetarian options like we have over here to sample and not aware of allergy-free options. We provide gluten-friendly meals. We note our eight, now nine, allergens in all of our food on our menu signs as well as online. Nine being the sesame we added as well. And less breading and less frying. So for those who are not aware, we don't even have a fryer in the kitchen. Everything is baked, but there are breaded, you know, the kids love the chicken tenders and the mini corn dogs and all the stuff that's brown. But just so everybody is aware, we do not fry anything, including fries. And then offering like a deli bar and hot soup, which we have offered soup before, and we are looking to have a deli bar next year, which we're excited about. So quality and freshness. So this being post-COVID, dare I say, we still had to provide the meals, especially at the elementary schools, in the plastic packaging. And that was for COVID safety, for quickness, um, to get the line the lines going quickly so the perception was that the food was not made in the kitchen that we ordered it in or it was microwavable but i assure you that all four schools made their food on site put it in those containers and served it to the kids um, and then next year well at deer path we moved to the reusable trays and then next year at the elementary schools we'll go back to the reusable or disposable trays and if we can serve the food directly on the plate or the tray, it'll make it a lot more fresh and taste and temperature. Less processed foods, more scratch made items. That is definitely one of our main focuses, especially that we don't have to prepackage everything. So we could do more customizable. We can do pasta and sauce separate. If you want just plain pasta, if you want sauce with um, pasta with marinara, 
taco bar, all of those kind of things we're excited to be able to offer next year. We know that there's been some concerns about milk, which we can address later, but we have since fixed the issues. We've had some expired milk issues with confusion of the milk. We got reimbursed for milk and we set it aside and some of the people like the teacher's aides or the students grabbed that not knowing it was expired. So we've changed our procedures, we've checked coolers, so we apologize about that food safety issue. Having one to two hot options available in addition to the daily special for the K through four grades especially, that's something we are definitely gonna look at. This year we wanted to get the kids through quickly. We do have salads and sandwiches available every day and we can definitely look at hot options next year. Enough food for all lunches. This was a common one, um, especially at Deer Path, you know, the, the popular items, the chicken sandwich I know is a main one and we keep upping our production and making sure we don't run out of food because obviously that is not ideal. One parent actually said starch, or multiple parents said starch at every meal, so whether it's orzo or rice or fries, so we will definitely try to menu that. Pricing value in your handout, or your packet, you have, a, I think it's the second one. We created this handout, and I think everyone received in an email, of what's in a meal. So for a very low price, you get a, an entree, hot or cold. Doesn't matter if it's the daily special, it could be the sandwich or the salad. You get fruit and veggie bar, and you get a milk or a 16 ounce bottle of water. So I don't think parents were aware of that, especially in the beginning, which is why we created this flyer and marketed it out, put it on the website. So that is definitely the best value. In elementary school, this is pretty much what's offered. And then informing parents that you could see what the kids are purchasing on the website or on the um, My School Books. You also in your packet have our food philosophy. So this is something that Quest is very proud of that we have in all 110 accounts that we serve. And just to highlight some of it is we only offer cage-free eggs. None of our milk has growth hormone in it. We use whole USDA beef, so there's no, or proteins, there's no fillers. It's all comes in um, whole and we bake it in-house or roast it in-house. Like the turkey we had was fresh turkey that we roasted in-house. And we never use MSG and we also don't serve anything with trans fat, just to name a few. I'm gonna turn it over to Nick. Thank you. Um, is this working? Yeah, it's good. All right. I just wanted to close really quickly. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, just a, a couple of quick points. Uh, first, thank you for being here uh, today and for those of you that participated in the survey. Um, just really quick, for, for those of you it's like uh, that might not have any sense of who Quest is and, and what we do, um, we're a locally owned company. We're based in Lombard. We've been around since 1985. 95% um, of our business is K-12 work. Um, some other schools that we work with just really quickly, um, we've got about 100 different K-12 schools that we work with in and around Chicagoland. Um, we work with Francis Parker, they've been a client of ours since 2014, I think. Um, the British International Schools, 2016, University of Chicago Lab Schools, um, Hinsdale K-8 Schools, Park Ridge K-8 Schools. Um, so we've got, um, you know, we've got quite a few partners that I think we can do a better job of, of pulling some resources for to help support what we're doing here at Lake Forest, which I'll talk about here in just a second. Um, we also serve some of the high schools that you guys would be familiar with, New Trier, Lake Forest High School, the Glenbrook Schools, um, Loyola Academy. Um, so we feel like we've got a great roster of some places that are really looking for a different type of experience from a, you know, a quality and, and experience standpoint for their students. Um, I'm a Lake Bluff resident, um, so my student is at, uh, is at the Lake Bluff Middle School and he's eating food that we're actually producing down here as well. Um, so uh, I get to talk to my, with my son uh, every day about, about what he eats, um, which is an interesting, an interesting conversation for sure, um, and him letting me know how much he thinks that some of our employees at Lake Bluff uh, Middle School deserve uh, raises, even though he has no idea how much they get paid, um, just because of the, the kind of service that he gets, which is great. But, um, I just wanted to conclude by saying a couple things. You know, the, um, this is Margaret's first full year um, here at Lake Forest, um, and this year has really been an interesting year. Um, and at some point in time, you know, the headwinds that we've all faced from COVID become an excuse. Um, 
I think this, this year with getting, uh, getting all of our locations staffed, what we've dealt with from a supply chain standpoint and pricing standpoint, um, and some of the mitigations and restrictions that we've had to put in place, like serving meals in plastic containers, have not made life easy for us um, in any way, shape, or form. With that being said, it's time to move past that, um, and, and I think we accept that responsibility fully. Um, I would say on, on behalf of our whole team, um, we know we can do better. Um, I think what we're going to be looking at as a result of what's happened from these surveys and these conversations and what will come about tonight um, is really how do we draw upon some of the resources that we have from places like Francis Parker and Lab and some of these other schools where um, the, the program looks and feels a bit different than what we have here at 67. Um, and I think that reimagination and that sharing of resources, and I think um, specifically an investment in culinary talent that we've not had here at 67 before, is something that we're committed to making happen over the summer. Um, so very open to hearing the you know, continued feedback and dialogue this evening. Um, but I just, I, I guess I wanna say as, as we wrap up our part before we turn this over to other folks, um, you know, we've, um, We've really appreciated the opportunity to be involved in these discussions and we've heard the messages loud and clear about where we need to go with the program and we'll be working closely with the APT and of course with the administration on what that direction looks like um, to make sure that Margaret and her team here have the right support and the right direction and, and we are absolutely committed to, to doing that. So thank you. Thanks, Nick. I would like at this time, because we're co-hosting with the APT to invite Lisa, are you going to the podium? Uh, Lisa to give a little overview about um, her thoughts and views on this partnership and um, her experiences with where we are at 67. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me, Jordan? <laughs> Good. All right. All right. I don't think my slides have made it in here. Should I refresh? It's on. Mm -hmm. While she's talking, while she's working on this, uh, just a couple of quick things that we'll be making some changes to next year. Um, I know grab and go options have been something that's been a specific point of conversation. I think we've got um, a pretty quick solution that we can put in place for the start of next school year uh, for additional grab and go options, snacks, salads, uh, wraps, sandwiches, all those types of things. I think we found some. Uh, really cost-effective equipment that we can get um, put in place at, at a bare minimum at Deer Path Middle School, and we'll certainly take a look at the other schools as well. Um, so hopefully some of those addition of grab-and-go options will be, uh, will be a nice addition to the program for some other healthy choices, and especially for students who don't want to wait in line uh, or maybe are just looking for some additional variety. Um, so I think that will be a nice add. I'm trying to fill here while we're waiting on uh, these guys. Um, yeah. I've, Maybe, I don't know, I feel like a radio host who's like the, <laughs> the person who was in the interview just spaced out on him. But now the fun stuff comes and Lisa Olson is ready to go and is gonna tell us all these cool things. All right, well I wanna thank the district for having me here to be part of this very important conversation regarding school lunch and the direction we're gonna head. Uh, most of you know me here, but just a brief intro. I'm a mom of two. I have a fifth and seventh grader, <clears throat> excuse me, a DPM who've come up through Cherokee. I'm a dietitian. I focus on nutrition education in schools and really forming positive associations with healthy choices for kids, how to empower them. I have been a part of the Food Service Committee for several years and took on the exec role this year. And through just interfacing with parents and students over the years um, with the district and with Quest, I have a new title of lunch lady. So that's kind of what I am in the community everywhere I go. Um, you, I'd be shocked if you haven't had a conversation with me about school lunch. And I'm thrilled to have Tanner Van Dusen as a counterpart. Um, many of you know her as well, but she has, she was chief innovation officer. One of our clients, um, biggest clients was in grocery and retail. So she's been amazing at helping pull market trends and kind of shape where we want this to go in our discussions with Quest in the district. So why does it matter? Well, the statistic we've come across is that by the time a child goes from kindergarten through 12th grade, they have up to 4,000 opportunities to have a meal at school. So we know food is information. We know that every bite is a message towards health or a message away from it. 
We know these are opportunities to form um, connections and associations with food and a way to kind of form their palate. So we really want to be mindful of what we're going to provide in the school environment. So a little bit digging a little deeper into the why of this and why it's important. Um, one of the things that drove me from working with adults and personalized nutrition and kind of affecting their diet and lifestyle change into working with children is a statistic that came out a little bit over 10 years ago. And the statistic was that this is the first generation of children that aren't expected to outlive their parents. So that's really, if you just let that sit for a minute, it's a really staggering statistic and it's one that we don't want to continue that trend. Um, a lot of that is due to seeing things that were, are traditionally seen in the adult population like heart disease, overweight and obesity, hypertension, high, um, high blood sugar, things like that that are creeping in younger and younger. So we definitely want to be mindful of this. A lot of that is attributed to the standard American diet, otherwise known as the SAD diet, which is focused on processed foods, high sugars, high fats, um, just not a lot of real foods. And the standard American diet is really being pushed by the food industry, right? They put chemicals in foods a lot of times just to um, create the reaction, create the taste that, all, that people love. So we really want to put messaging, our kid, the kids are in the school eight hours a day, that is kind of combating this and have healthy messaging that they're exposed to as well. So I talked a little bit about food as information, but we know that certain nutrients are really going to fuel them throughout the day. It affects their academic performance. It affects their behavior. Um, we have observed that. We all know that as parents. So what can we do to set them up for a good day? Um, we also know the school environment is really powerful. What they learn here impacts the choices they make. So how can we carry this through, not just through the nutritional choices we make, but through the messaging throughout the day? So tonight we're really talking about the nutritional standards and crafting where we want that vision to go. But we also always want to look through it the lens of the whole child wellness. How are we um, looking at the whole child? How are we creating an environment in the middle of the day that is going to be one that's relaxing, where they can go, where they can make connections, where they can really have community? And when I talk about the students, um, I'd be remiss not to mention faculty and teachers and staff. We really want this to be something that we re-envision, that it's a place where they want to go and um, make choices and model behaviors and be with the kids. So we're really looking at the whole school environment. Um, a lot of you know who have kids at Deer Path. Um, some of you may be elementary, but it can be a stressful time. Um, the way the seats are structured, it's not just the food, but the seats are permanent seats two feet apart. And with COVID, they had to sit even further apart. So a lot of times the kids are running to try to get a seat so that they're not left out. Um, so they're already coming to this in kind of a stressful state, right? Um, if the lines are too long, if they're in Latin, great, they get in the line at the beginning of the line. If they're in Spanish, forget it. Like they're gonna be, you know, at the back of the line. So we really wanna turn this environment from one that is fight or flight to rest and digest. We want them to come in, we want them to take a deep breath, we want them to really enjoy the experience. Um, so in that context, while we're looking at the nutritional parameters, we're really considering all of these things that affect the whole child and their wellness environment. Um, <clears throat> I just want to be clear too, when we talk about nutrition, we, above all, it has to taste good. We're not looking at bringing in obscure options that are really nutritionally sound. We want to bring in things that are nutrient dense, um, colorful, good options that kids are going to want to eat. So that is above and beyond. Um, when we look at the different age groups, K through eight is pretty much getting the same thing right now with an expansion into different options in the middle school. But we want to look at what's appropriate for their age. So maybe we start out with foods that are more kid friendly and we evolve into making kids more food friendly as they grow through the years and we kind of educate them. Um, and then this is just a picture of some of the work I do in the schools. And, nutrition education and some of the messaging that we try to affect. And it seems very simple, but it's powerful. There are messages that the kids go home with. They start reading labels. They start measuring the sugar content um, so that they can make choices on their own. So we want to take this outside of just the health and wellness classes, but we want to really expand it through the school. How can we create a uniform message where they're hearing it and seeing it visually throughout the day? So thank you for your time.
Thanks, Lisa, very much. Sure. When Lisa and I spoke early on in the school year, I talked a little bit about um, my own personal journey as a parent and trying to um, figure out how to eat healthy at home and the journey that we've had. Uh, my children um, are not always amused with Blaine and myself <laughs> because we do, we went, uh, we actually went completely plant-based for a while um, and we allowed chicken nuggets in um, as our saving grace. And we're, we've kind of went from both extremes to try to figure out what works for us as a family. Uh, but we do really focus on um, trying to expose them at home to very different types of foods that are colorful and rich in nutrients and are not a lot of processor, or processed. Um, and then we have weak moments where we're in the drive through at McDonald's. So I mean, it's, it's, I think it's that battle. And we're trying to find what works for us here in 67 as well that is a balanced approach. So I would like to move into the questions that have been submitted. So there's been some that were submitted, some we've created. Um, and then we can, if we have time, we'll also open up to the discussion here to see what questions you may have. But we have some already um, in the queue uh, from uh, us asking our constituents. So I have um, the pleasure of asking the questions. I get the easy job tonight instead of answering them. Uh, I'm normally in the hot seat, but not tonight. So here we go. So the first one is uh, for uh, Mr. Wegley. And here's the question. What do we know about District 67 food service from the student perspective? What are you seeing and hearing? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Montgomery. Uh, if you ever want to get a good view into what the adolescent experiences, come to DPM's cafeteria at lunch. Uh, actually, come on by uh, and, and check it out. It is a very different experience, and I think that that's what we see. I'm in the lunchrooms on a daily basis uh, to see just kind of what is going on and where kids are. And you do see a variety of kids' experiences in the lunchroom, specifically looking at the environment and looking at the food choices that they make for Every once in a while, I'll be in the lunch line and there will be a kid looking at the calories on it and just going, I'm on a calorie deficit right now. I don't know what that means, uh, but they are very cognizant of it. And then there's the kid walking out with 15 bags of chips. <laughs> uh, and that is, is kind of the, the scope of things. Chicken sandwiches, very popular. Chicken sandwiches, they're all about. But every once in a while, there's a meal where they're saying, I, I really don't want this. This, is, this isn't my jam and they're, they're throwing away some of the food that they're getting as well. So all in all, I think the biggest takeaway that I see as an adult who's in that cafeteria, but listening to the kids as they give their perspectives, I think the taste factor and the health factor are, are the two big things. I think you guys nailed it is what you were talking about uh, for what we wanna make sure we're offering. Uh, because right now, I think there's a disconnect of the healthy cho choices versus the pretzel that's salted and and delicious um, and just being able to find that common ground i think all kids would be super on board of i remember when you guys came in and did like the star fruit uh, and different options like that kids were loving it so they were eating these really healthy foods and really enjoying that so it's it's all about how we sell it how we offer it uh, and i think that that would go a long way for our kids they're looking for that uh, they definitely are as a group looking for the choices that are going to keep them full that are going to help them out because right now they want what's good, so they grab three Izzy's and four bags of chips and a pretzel, and then they're hungry in two periods. Uh, so I think that's really what we want to look at improving as we move forward from the student lens. Thank you, kind sir. And also, thank you for the invite to middle school lunches. <laughs> um, I started out as a high, I was a high school teacher, and my first principalship was a middle school. And I was terrified of them, because high school was my world. Uh, they, um, I just was comfortable with 9th through 12th grade, and the middle school just scared me, but I was so excited for my first principalship, and the scariest place for me was the lunchroom. And I quickly fell in love with me because they laughed at my jokes. <laughs> and they smelled funny and looked funny and all those things that happens when you're preteen and teen. Um, and I would always uh, be frightened and amused from a sociological experimentation way to watch 5th graders and 6th grade lunch and then seventh grade, about halfway through the year, all heck breaks loose. And then they're gone from the half of seventh grade to eighth grade. And then I taught freshmen, and they would come back, the girls first, 
um, in their freshman year and come back to humanity. And then the boys, they come back when they're about 25. Uh, but it's just an amazing time. Um, and it's a gift to be able to work with that population. Um, I didn't appreciate that at first, but now um, they're one of my favorite uh, kids or age groups to spend time with. Okay, second question. This is for, now it could be whoever wants to take it. It could be Rebecca, Margaret, or Jen, or anybody else for that uh, matter. But here is the question. What are some of the post-pandemic food service changes we can expect in District 67? What are some of the post-pandemic food service changes we can expect in 67? I don't know if I should use this or this. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna use this. So we made an effort to rethink food service during the pandemic in a way that provided our families when they needed it and what they needed. So I know the past two years we offered the USDA um, and ISB program that allowed family, any actually anybody, any children 18 or younger to pick up free meals from the district twice a week, I think it was. And then that program ran from 2020 to 2021, so it was June of 2021. So it ended at the end of last school year. So some have asked why we no longer are offering this program. And I don't know, Jen, if you wanna take that one. Sure, I will, um, happy to. Um, thanks everyone for being here. And I would like to say thank you for Quest with helping us with that option because we very quickly pivoted um, when we came to that point in time when we realized we had families in need um, and not just serving Lake Forest and Lake Bluff families, but we serve quite a large constituency. And I don't remember how many meals we were serving every single week, but it was shocking, absolutely shocking. However, once we came back uh, to opening up school full time and um, had the ability to serve lunch on site we did go away from that option we're actually not a part of the national school lunch program either and it's really for the same reason the reason is we want to be able to offer the program that we want to offer that our parents want that our students want that our staff want if we were on some of these programs we would be limited for example there's a limits and controls on portion sizes on i don't know all the new nutritious parts i'll leave that to them but there are items that we do serve that we do feel falls within our nu nutrient standards that we would not be able to serve if we were on these programs um, so that is part of it um, also too when you're on those programs we did receive reimbursement for them but the amount that we would see from those reimbursement wouldn't come close to covering the cost of the meals that we that we actually serve. So that was part of it as well. Okay, thank you. And then when students and staff returned to the building, especially at the beginning of the school year, we couldn't have the quote unquote normal program. So we, um, as the district, decided to use single serving fresh food that was packaged rather than offered directly, like I was talking about early, directly on a tray or a plate. And that has still, like I said, continued at the elementary school. And then, you know, Deer Path, we were able to do it, I don't know, the second semester sometime. And like I said, we're using the reusable tray. So not only, it's not disposable anymore, it's the reusable ones that we wash every day at Deer Path. And then, to be clear, all food is made in-house. We're lucky enough at this district that all four schools have their own kitchen and we're producing out of all four kitchens for that school. So all the food is made freshly prepared on site. And because of COVID, a lot of parents, we got a lot of feedback. We were gonna start the fruit and veggie bar in January, but with Omicron being so bad, we got a lot of feedback from parents saying, we're not comfortable with this yet. So as a district, we decided to hold off until I think it was after spring break where the numbers were a little lower and it's been going very well. It's the kids are loving it. They're fully taking advantage of it. And Deer Path doesn't take advantage of it as much, but the cashier are encouraging every kid to take at least a fruit and or a vegetable with their meal. So we are encouraging them. Thank you all. Um, I would like to, so I told you I have several questions that are already in the queue, but I don't want to miss the chance for those of you who are here. Um, I would like to open the floor up do you have any specific questions that you would like to ask the panel right now? Go get them. Just don't put me in the hot seat, okay? Hello, hi, I'm Becky Jo Miranda. I have a daughter in seventh grade, as well as a third grader at Cherokee. My question for the panel, and Lisa probably already knows because we're neighbors, so we've talked food for many, many, many years, is, um, I have a daughter with an allergy 
And for many, many years, the menu just is not user friendly to parents and or students in terms of recognizing what the allergy is. <laughs> I know in the past couple of years they had the icons. That was helpful. I noticed in the fall the icons went away. Um, then I noticed the icons came back. I'm now looking at this sheet and the icons are not there, but then on page two, three, four, it talks a little bit about what's in it. Um, so I guess I kind of want to know where Quest is thinking about how they recognize and talk about allergies. Um, I have found it to be not user friendly throughout many, many years. Um, we constantly get the comment, I think I emailed Margaret in the fall, hi Margaret, I think I emailed you one time, hey, um, what's in this? And they always say, well, your child can always come and talk to anybody here. I think we're really looking for, this needs to be quick, efficient, um, immediate, and also I would throw it out to the administration of more than a parent knowing what's in it, I have a child who can manage their allergy extremely well. This needs to be accessible to the student so they can look at it in the cafeteria and they can see the egg icon or whatever icon it is. Um, so I just kind of want to check in to see there's been progress, but as a, chi a parent who has a child with an allergy, I think we're not quite there yet, and we probably could do a little bit better. So I kind of just want to see what direction we're heading as I look at that the format's already changing. Thank you for that question. Um, I think in the uh, few seconds that you were asking your question there, uh, we've got a bit of a disconnect, I think, on the way the, the format in which these menus are coming out on that we need to fix. So what it sounds like, if I'm understanding this correctly, is the platform that we use for all of our back of house menuing and production work that produces the allergen icons, that is not the same format of the menu that's getting sent out to the parents on a, week, on a regular basis. So thank you for identifying that. Um, we have allergens turned on in that system company-wide, so we're not trying to shy away from having those, but clearly we've got some communication stuff that we need to fix on this, and I appreciate you bringing it up. If I can ask, are the allergen icons a helpful way for you and your student to identify those specific issues? Yes, I think that that's very user friendly. Okay. Because you can just look and see here it is, and you don't have to then click. Sure. Let's go to page three and scroll down. I yeah. mean, I think that's very user friendly and would be very user friendly for the student. That's very fair. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, and sorry for the frustration on that. It's very fair feedback. Um, Could the administration speak really quickly of like how do the student find this information? Because I think it's fine for parents, but the reality is it's especially in middle school. I know my child mostly, we, we don't even get hot lunch. Specifically, we have in the past, but this year it just has not met our needs in terms of having that information readily available. How do the students get this? Can they have access on Schoology? Is it is the uh, poster that would have the icon printed in it? Because they don't want to spend their time tracking down Margaret or other people to say, hey, does this bread have egg in it or whatever? That's a great question. Do you want me to chime in? Yes, please. Um, <laughs> I told you I don't want to be in the hot seat. That's a great question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that's printed that has the items that are offered that day. I don't believe the list has the icons, but we can work with you to make sure that those are available to the students. It just says what the offerings are um, at the start of the lunch line. So we can obviously add those icons if we can get those from Quest. And additionally, we are currently revising our school website district wide. And we intend to have a focus group of students of how do you want to use the website? What would be accessible for you? This sounds like the perfect thing to be included as one of those quick links. If kids are craving that information, that's the right place to have it. Could I add one thing? Would it be helpful if not only do I put the icons, but I could put 
gluten, dairy, egg, in letters so the kids can read it instead of just the icon? Would that help? I, I mean, whether it's the icons or the words, I mean, maybe the icons might be better for the elementary school, but they may not be But maybe if I put the, the, the icon with the word, the kids could yeah. understand what the icon meant. Yeah. So yeah. I'll start doing that tomorrow. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that question. Next question. Hi, I'm Lisa Walsh. I have one in sixth grade, and I have one in the high school as well. Um, in 2019, prior to COVID hitting, we had um, partnered the, with the support of the Lake Forest Junior Garden Clubs. We had partnered with Quest to bring food from our garden clubs and having it being served in the cafeteria. Um, it was kind of part of a program of Grow What You Eat. <coughs> just trying to establish with our kids more of, I, I think if, if you grow it, you're probably going to try to eat it. And they loved having it in the salad bars. Um, I was just wondering if we could bring back some of those programs and maybe even expand on that. Heck yes. <laughs> how would, how would I mean, I would, I would be happy to start taking the lead on that again. How would, how would we go about doing we that? Connect after the meeting, is that okay? So we can exchange yeah. contact information and get rolling from there? Yeah. That's awesome. Hi, I'm uh, Jessica Harris. I have a daughter that's a kindergartner at Everett. Um, I had a question about kind of the transparency between the a la carte and the pricing that's available. So right now, um, one of the, the comments that you made was that there's a lot of gluten-free options. But if you look at every single entree on here, there's nothing that's gluten-free um, or safe for a celiac to eat. So she sometimes is limited to the fruit and veggie bar but I would see the charge on my on my app as being a 60 cent fruit side one day and then it would go to $3. And knowing that the, the student meal is an entree, fruit and veggie bar plus the milk is 460, I kind of was trying to understand how the different pricing worked out and what's an easy way to see that because I'm chasing a menu down, um, I don't see anything on there that she can eat, and then I just see the, the bill show up in my app uh, at the end of the week, kind of when I'm scrolling through. The, um, the unlimited uh, fruit and salad bar changed after spring break. The, they used to just get the fruit and it was 60 cents, mm -hmm. but then after break, we went to the unlimited, so she's probably getting charged $3, and it's an unlimited fruit and veggie bar, so they can come up as many times as they like. That might be where the confusion is. Is there an option to just get fruit and veggies without being unlimited? Because you can't, she can't get the full entree because it's she three can't. I, it's three dollars just for the unlimited fruit and veggie bar. They can come up as many times as they want, or it comes with their meal, and the meal is four sixty. Is there an option to get a side of fruit and veggies that's not unlimited? Because I have to bring her meal anyways from home, and I don't want to pay an extra three dollars every day sure. just for the. I'm sure, I'm sure we, we can, can figure that, that out. Absolutely. For sure. If I could address the gluten-free, actually gluten-friendly, because obviously we're not a gluten-free certified kitchen, but like for example, I'm looking at the menu here. So we could do gluten-free, gluten-friendly pasta with marinara sauce. We could do you know Greek chicken without the pita on gluten-free bread. We could do grilled cheese on gluten-free bread. So that's why that we say we have gluten-free available options. We could put it more on the menu. That's something we need to market over the summer, but we can make majority of these items, gluten-free pizza, gluten-free everything, available to the students. There just hasn't been people, you know, reaching out asking for it, but we can definitely accommodate that. Could you explain you. the process of how they would get it? Like, do they have to come in the morning? Do they have to let Margaret know? So at the elementary schools, they tally. The teachers, you know, they take a tally of how many, you know, pizzas, how many grilled cheese, whatever. And that morning, if the student tells the teacher, I want a gluten-free grilled cheese, then we'll add, they'll add that to the tally, it'll notify the kitchen, and we'll have that ready for that student. What about Same, similar, well, we don't do, um, they can ask for it, because if we, it's a higher cost item, so if we have just gluten-free pasta there, and nobody eats it, but they can ask for it, or if we know that there's a demand for it, we can serve it every day, and hopefully, you know, kids will take part in that. But we can offer it every single day. And we always have gluten-free bread available, too. So like for a hamburger, we can put that on a gluten-free roll, for example. It, 
so it sounds like we've got some work yeah. to do though on just what the process looks Marketing. like at Deer Path Middle School. And you've touched you touched on the price, Rebecca, but I think the the other important part, if you guys have been in any of the spaces, we're really limited on how on how much we can offer from a variety standpoint. So if we have every gluten-free option that we have available for the day out in addition to the regular entree option, it's probably taking up space from something else that might apply to more students. And that's just a balance that we've got to wade through. But it sounds like we've got some work to do on just clarifying the process and making sure that that's communicated well to the community. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and the point on the, on the pricing for the fruit and veg stuff too. Thank you. So uh, before we go back, because we're talking about pricing, um, Margaret or Rebecca, will you just go over again what is in the combo meal or the, the general meal? And then, Jan, I'm going to come to you and ask you how we determine pricing because that was another question that was submitted ahead of time. So everybody should have the handout as a reference, but it is a hot or cold entree, so it could be anything. At the elementary school, it's the daily special or it's the salad or sandwich. And at DPM, it's the daily special. The It could be chicken tenders. It could be pizza. Whatever the hot entree is available, multiple entrees, or the cold. It could be a salad. It could be a sandwich. And that comes with a fruit and veggie bar, unlimited, and then a, um, a milk or a 16-ounce bottle of water. Thank you. Jen, so the question that was submitted was, how do we determine pricing for food in the district? And I do get this question a lot. Um, so there seems always a little confusion about how the revenue comes in and how the expenses are covered. So to be clear, it is a district program, meaning the district collects all of the revenue from food service and the district pays all of the expenses. Um, so we pay Quest a management fee, um, but we're collecting the revenue and we're paying for all the food, all the consumables, all the paper goods, all of those things. The general philosophy is that we, the food service program by itself needs to be self-sustaining, meaning we're not going to take taxpayer funds to um, basically offset the cost of food service or to supplement it in, in any way. So basically we try to break even. We don't need to make a profit, but we need to not be using other available resources to cover the cost of our program. It has been exceedingly difficult, as for many of you that has gone, have gone to a grocery store lately, um, to do so this year. I know Quest came to me um, probably November and December and said, Gen Food is up 16%, um, and we're going to be killed, basically. I think is nicely what Nick said to me. <laughs> um, but basically, the prices that we were at was not going to cover the expenses that we were going to have this year. So we will have to probably moderate that a little bit going forward, but generally speaking, we try to break even. We do also, within that, cover the cost of, I would say, basic equipment. So if we need small pieces of equipment or they say, hey, I would like an open air cooler um, because we think it's going to market the grab and goes better, we will work that into the budget. Usually we buy equipment purchases in the spring because we have a good idea how the, the revenue over expenditures are looking. Um, we could not absorb in any way, shape, or form, to be clear, any major renovations. So we are looking at some changes. I hope I'm not doing a spoiler alert. Um, some major changes to the DPM cafeteria. Obviously, that cannot be funded through what we collect on food service revenues. So I do get the question from time to time, like, well, I could buy a fill-in-the-blank at Costco for X. That's true. You probably can. But you can't buy it at a restaurant. Right, because included in the cost of that product is the cost of labor to bring it there. It's the serving of it. It's all the other things that go with that. But in the end, we just try to break even um, is where we are. I think that's an important component because I don't want the community to feel as if we are using this to fund our operating balance. So th we are really trying to just keep it level. Um, but I, Jen and I both don't want to run in the red for food services, um, so we adjust accordingly. She adjusts accordingly. I just nod and say thank you. <laughs> Next question, please. And just to be mindful, because I will be true to this time, we have about five minutes left. So, uh, Megan, after your question, we'll probably start to wrap up. So, uh, my name is Megan Engelberg. I have two kids at Deer Path and one at the high school. I have a quick question as far as how the um, budget goes for personal accounts. My kids were on auto pay, and there was a lot of recharges, so I took them off of auto pay. And then all of a sudden, they were like, I have no more money in my lunch account. And then I when to pay it and I already, I was like $90 in the red on all of them. So I'm not sure if that, how that works or if it can cut them off at zero or if there's. So this is a tough one. Um, 
so the state of Illinois, um, I think it was three years ago, passed this uh, no lunch shaming bill um, that puts all of the public schools in the state in a really difficult position from taking food away from students or denying students access to food, whether they're on the national school lunch program or not. Um, this is a really slippery slope. Um, we find ourselves, Margaret and her team, find, find themselves in a really difficult spot where um, you may be able to have a conversation with your student so that your student doesn't know that, or so that your student knows that there's no money in his or her account and to not get lunch that day. There are a lot of other parents, myself included, this happened with my son, where uh, you go through the line and the student doesn't know, and then our staff is faced with this really awkward and difficult conversation and decision about whether or not we're supposed to take food out of a student's hand and put it back in the, in the cooler or discard it. Um, and then the state passed uh, a law here a couple of years ago that that's actually prohibited. We can't stop students from having uh, that type of experience. So it's a really difficult uh, conversation to work through. Um, it's part of the reason why we want parents to have access to what those balances look like. Um, I would not say at all, however, that we couldn't re-engage with the administration at the schools and s see if there's different guardrails or methods that we want to put in place if we get to a certain point. We have at other schools, for example, high school might be a better example where if a student goes beyond a certain balance, they have to go to the dean's office to get a slip basically to come in and get food again so that there's at least a trigger that there's a, a conversation with the student and the family. I'm not suggesting we do or don't do that here. That needs to be the administration's decision. It, and I'm not ignoring your question, I think this is a topic we need to revisit with the administration here, is a very, very, very slippery slope. It seems like in our industry, literally once or twice a week, we're reading articles about lunch uh, personnel taking food out of students' hands, and that is awful. Um, so I appreciate your question, and I, we will pick that conversation back up with the administration here. Thank you. I, I will add a little bit to that as well, though, because I know, I mean, I'm the mom of, of three boys. All will have graduated as of May. So thankfully, I've made it that, through that milestone. Um, but you know, busy working mom, so I had no clue where their lunch balance was, and I I'm completely oblivious on what they were charging every day unless someone told me. So I know one of the things that we've talked about is um, getting into some uh, at least like some sort of rhythm, so that when you hit a low balance number, to make sure that we're sending an email or we're sending a letter or a text or whatever it is you want to, you can set it to make sure that, that people are aware before it's kind of too late. Hold on. But I also think that when I look at what they're buying, like I don't know that everyone needs to be eating the Doritos. Like I think if it's like they need the actual lunch, maybe the lunch that's offered versus, you know, the Izzy and, and the Doritos. So I just didn't know if they're yeah. right. And I think that is, that's something that we can talk about with Quest of basically what is a school procedure that can be in place uh, for handling that. You could also do it like when I was in high school and my dad was my principal, he would use my account and I'd be negative without buying anything. <laughs> uh, so we will absolutely have that conversation where we can talk about a school procedure of a way that we could communicate that clearly. It would okay, be nice so kind of almost like in the app if you could set, I know it's kind of rebuilding the app, but as families like that you're talking about and for my kids that sometimes buy too many Gatorades or something where you could put parameters on it like you're not allowed to buy that anymore. Not because you won't want them to eat their food, but because you just want them to make better choices. <laughs> okay, so we... Do, do, do the students see the price of what they buy so they can manage? Yes. Not at the elementary. I, I, I don't... The elementary just want the price. So at DPM, they do see the prices? Yes. So Third DPM, price. they see the prices. Elementary, it's one price for the whole meal. So the I think there is a good opportunity to re-communicate um, it because sometimes when kids were getting three components of the lunch and not all four, exactly. they were getting, ch and then grabbing a bag of chips, everything was charged separately. I know they've been working on that, but um, I do think we need to re-educate the kids yeah. and re-communicate. I see, for example, I have been charged today for two lunch. <laughs> so I'm not sure she had two lunch. Lots of great opportunities. A lot of great opportunities here. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 
I agree. I'll, also, just one quick one uh, on that, Matt, as well, is uh, thanks to the help of our good friend Jordan here um, on the technology side, um, we were able to um, purchase some digital signage. So for those of you who are familiar specifically with uh, starting at Deer Path, there are very easy, nice spots right by the front of the line. Um, where we can now control the digital messaging. So we've talked about how we might do that. I think we're looking at that in partnership with the APT as well. So do we want to highlight new, new uh, nutrition month or an item? Do we want to list the prices? Do we want to list the menus? So that's an option we didn't, uh, did not previously have available. As soon as Jordan gets those delivered and up, then we can start playing with them this summer. And hopefully I think that'll change some of the um, communication experience too in the fall. Thank you. So what I would like to do, we are over the hour mark, but I would like to ask one more question. And then I'm sure the panel can be available afterwards to ask any additional questions you would have. And I would encourage you to try the sampling because there's a great deal of food back there that we, Quest is highlighting so you can experience some of those options. So please, um, at the very least, take something and go. Uh, the last question is a little bit aspirational in nature because we're starting to have conversation about what we can do for the future of space at DPM. So I'm going to ask a question, and this is for Nick and Tanner, um, but, the, uh, but know that it's coming from the lens of how can we reimagine uh, the space that we have available, particularly in Deer Path. What are other schools in our region or other places around the country doing that may be aspirational for our district? And that's for Nick and Tanner to kind of talk. And um, I'm gonna limit you to less than five minutes, both of you. Combined, just so we're clear. <laughs> I do talk um, I mean, I called a lot of the districts in the northern part of Illinois, and it's hard to find a district that's actually really satisfied with what's going on. Um, but if you look at other parts of the country, there are people that are just doing amazing, amazing stuff. Um, I think if you look at Berkeley, California, um, and they've got this edible classroom program that was started by Alice Waters, um, it's worth reading about. They're deeply rooted in a mission and a vision. If you learn about how that came about, it's because the community said, this is important. This is important to us and it's important to our kids. And we're going to really make that, make sure that everything we're doing ladder is up to that. Um, they're involving their curriculum in teaching, so they're having chefs that are going into the classroom when they're talking about the spice trade to talk about spices, to talk about umami. They're doing um, a lot around waste and recycling programs and making sure that that is really prevalent. Much better jobs of marketing and communication and community involvement. If you look at um, Portland and Boulder and Burlington, they're doing things like having kids make the menu boards, having kids help merchandise the, the food. Um, they're doing a lot of uh, interactive stuff like yogurt bars and baked potato bars and things that are much more like what the food service trends that they're seeing other places in the economy. So Chipotle type experience in schools. They're, they're expecting that choice. And so how are schools going to begin to lean in to what they're seeing in other parts of food service? I think Nick was going to talk about how he's seeing it in locally. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I would agree with a lot of what Tanner said in terms of some of the more uh, sort of nuts and bolts uh, work. I think if um, so many of our high schools that I mentioned, the Loyola's, the New Triers, even Lake Forest High School, Glenbrooks, it's a lot of uh, build to order, uh, assemble to order, um, sometimes even made to order, depending on what the space looks like, to give students so much more you know, choice. If you think about, as you said, Chipotle, I mean, students today is, have never grown up in an era where they didn't know Chipotle, didn't know Subway, didn't know Starbucks, where you get to have all these really customizable experiences at a value. And that's the type of program that we're offering at a lot of our high schools. Um, unfortunately, a lot of middle and elementary schools, the facilities don't really accommodate that. They don't really allow for that type of option. So um, I, I think the point that Tanner made around, you know, really understanding what the community voice is and what the community desire is from a broader, broader global perspective will certainly help influence the direction that we're given from the administration on where we go with the program, et cetera. But from a nuts and bolts standpoint, I think with, with uh, thinking about sort of the future of the program, we would envision a lot more customization, um, a lot more flexibility, uh, more variety, uh, more options for students to be able to utilize technology for information, for mobile ordering, et cetera. And I think running alongside that, a lot more quick, healthy options for students whose schedules maybe don't allow them to wait in line or they just don't want to wait in line or want to get something after school before they're going to, to practice, et cetera. Again, these are the types of things that we're doing in a lot of our high schools, and we're excited to be a part of the conversation about how future facility enhancements here um, might allow us to bring those types of programming uh, changes here as well. Thank you, Tanner. Thank you, Nick. Um, I am going to wrap up at this point, but I just want to just take a moment of gratitude and 
acknowledge the special community that we are all a part of. One of the reasons that Lake Forest became such a, um, a dream of mine to be a leader here is for these types of conversations. So you have the APT partnership, you have Quest partnership, you have the district partnership, and you have the parents who are here wanting to engage in the dialogue in a collective voice to figure out how we can best meet our, the needs of our kids. That's a pretty special environment to be a part of, and I just count my blessings that not only am I able to, be, to lead in this environment, but also have my students be a part of it as well. So thank you for giving up time to be here, and thank you to the panel as well. Uh, I'll have the panel stay here um, and or mingle a little bit so they can answer any additional questions you have, and then please, uh, I encourage you to try some of the samplings from Quest. Thank you. Yes. foodservice at lfschools.net. Thank you, everyone.